I want to begin with a story. It's a true story. This happened to a member of our church. I'm not going to give you their name. They wish to remain anonymous, but uh, this is a joyful story. This particular lady was speaking to another woman that she knew in the course of her daily work. And uh, as she was speaking to this other lady, the other lady became quite upset and probably was so before they began to talk. The reason that uh, she was so upset on that day was a close friend of hers had passed away. And uh, she said, oh, I hope he made it to heaven. He was such a good man. He went to church, she said. He probably went to heaven, right? To which the lady from our church answered, I hope. Or she answered, uh, and she gave the name of the lady. I'll skip that. She said her name, and she said this. Do you know that the Bible says we can know we're going to heaven? And we don't have to hope? Now, notice how this was handled. The lady's hope, desire, fond uh, Concern about this man who had died, who she knew, who said he was a good man, he went to church. She was hopeful that he might, maybe, be in heaven. And so, whereupon, the conversation was carried forward in this way. Do you know? Don't you know that the Bible says we can know? We're going to heaven. And we don't have to hope. Well, the lady became really excited and her eyes lit up and she said, Oh, you can know? You can know for sure? I want to know. And that gave them the opportunity for the lady from our church to share the plan of salvation with her. And upon uh, doing that, the other lady said, I want to know, can we pray together? And then she bowed her head and prayed and accepted Christ as her Savior. Now, I'll tell you that story because I want you to understand That's exactly what can happen if you pray for an opportunity. Remember last week, we talked about praying for an opportunity to share our faith. Colossians chapter 4, at verse 3, Paul says, Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak, the mystery of Christ. That was Paul's desire for an open door, for opportunities, and pray for opportunities. And I challenged you last week to pray for opportunities. That God would give you an opportunity to speak to someone about Christ. Now, you're not always going to have such an open door as the one I just described. You may only have an opportunity to share a word or a thought, or a Bible verse. You may not get a response such as I described. But God will use whatever you can contribute to that opportunity. I'm wondering, I'm just wondering, anybody here pray for an opportunity this week and God give them one? One? Two? Two? I see at least two that prayed for three. 
Four? Okay. I, I think as you think about it, you start to realize what God has done, perhaps. But uh, um, continue to do that. I challenge you. Pray that God will give you an opportunity to speak a word to someone, and he'll give you that opportunity. And this is what can happen. won't always happen, but it surely can happen. Now, let me set the context for the next step, because it's going to tie together. We're looking at this second half of the book of Colossians where Paul is giving us various commands. They're all in the present tense. They are things that are commanded of us that we should be doing all the time. And they are the things that should be a part of our life as born again people. He talked about our proper relationship in the home between husbands and wives in chapter 3, verses 18 to 19, and gave us some specifics about that. Then he, he went on to talk about the parent-child relationship in chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, and gave us some specific responsibilities there. Then he went on to talk about the employee-employer relationship in chapter 3, verse 22, and all the way down through chapter 4, verse 1. Last week, he talked about our relationship with our God through prayer. And he gave us some specifics about that. This week, he moves on to another step. This week, he wants to talk about how we should interact with non-believers, with those that are unsaved. And he gives us again a very specific present tense verb in the imperative mode, which makes it a command in chapter 4 and verse 5, when he says, walk, there's the command, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, meaning those who are outside of the faith, those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's another important area of responsibility that we have as God's children. Now, he gives us two specifics about this this particular area of our responsibility. Two things that we need to do to fulfill our responsibility toward those that are outside the faith. And the first one, as you can see on the screen, is this. Our walk should be exemplary. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the word walk refers to our conduct. Just everything about our life. Everything we do. And everything we do should set a positive example before other people. So our walk should be exemplary. He says, walk in wisdom toward those that are on the outside. Now, if you'll... I think I may have it on screen. Oh, here it is. You don't have to turn there. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2, the first part of the verse. Solomon gives us the purpose of the book of Proverbs. Uh, why it was written. And along with it, our responsibility in regard to it. He says, our job, our function, our responsibility is to know wisdom and instruction. Now, this word wisdom from the Hebrew means to know something in its most basic sense. The word in the Hebrew literally means something that is compacted or reduced to the essence of it. It is taking the whole of a, a, a subject and boiling it down to that which is the essence of it all. <clears throat> and the subject that he has in mind when he talks about walking in wisdom, is, of course, the Word of God, including the book of Proverbs specifically when he wrote that. But for us, uh, the whole of God's Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Now, the whole of God's message from Genesis to Revelation, is what? The Lord Jesus Christ became a man, died on a cross to save our souls, rose again from the dead, and by grace gives us eternal life. 
That's the crux of the matter. That's the message of the Word of God. Man became a sinner in the very first book, chronologically, way, way back, very near the creation of man. Man fell into sin. Every man has been born a sinner. Everything in the Old Testament then forward pointed to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Christ. The New Testament, we find that He did come. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross of Calvary. He fulfilled Scripture. And those who by faith believe in Him have His righteousness imputed to us by faith. We have everlasting life. We can know that we have everlasting life. We don't have to hope. It's not, well, I believe in Jesus and i got to do something else. No, it is by faith and faith alone that we are saved. Our righteousness is but as filthy rags before Him, as Isaiah said. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But we have righteousness that is our possession given to us freely. It is His righteousness that is ours because of our faith. And the message we bear when we walk in wisdom toward those on the outside is this basic, boiled down kernel of grace, the gospel that we are to communicate. In Proverbs 1 and verse 7, Solomon goes on to say, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, or the beginning of wisdom, you see. For fools despise wisdom and instruction. A fool in the book of Proverbs doesn't refer to someone who's, you know, lacks something mentally. It refers to someone who's hard-hearted. The Hebrew word for fool is one who's hardened. The hardened in the world. The hard-hearted reject wisdom. They reject the truth. They reject God's word. They reject the message of the gospel. And it is only through fear that they begin to come to real wisdom. Now fear here doesn't mean walking around in abject fear that God's going to strike you dead any moment. It is a word which means reverence, but a very healthy reverence, understanding who He is. So wisdom begins with the message of the Word of God, the unfolding of the plan of God for man, that we communicate to others, but it comes down to a person's response to God. God created us. We are responsible to Him. He made a way that we might be saved in spite of our sin. And if we fear Him, if we understand who He is, and we respond to Him on that basis, through faith we can be saved. But if we reject Him, there is no other answer. There is no work that can be done, no life that can be lived that will be good enough, and you will never, if you're counting on that sort of thing, never ever know. And the truth of the matter is, if you're counting on works, you don't really want to know where you're headed. You need faith in Christ. So, he says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Now, having said that, he tells us something about our daily walk. Something about our daily conduct that fits into this. And it describes the kind of walk we should have on a daily basis. Now what is that description? He says this, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. Now the word redeem means to purchase. To buy something. You understand our time is probably one of the most valuable things that we possess. We work for someone else, some company, some individual, some corporation. We are trading our time for our pay. There is an exchange, a monetary exchange of worth going on there. So, we are to redeem the time, see our time every day as we're walking through our daily activities. We need to view every moment in that day as a very valuable asset. And when we see an opportunity 
we need to buy up that opportunity. I'll give you an example. I recently went to Big Lots. Now, I like going to Big Lots not because I like to shop. I go to Big Lots because of the price. You understand? I mean, I, I've been in there enough, I pretty much know what they have. The other day, I, I, I needed some glue to fix something. Now, I could go to a lot of places and buy glue, uh, but I figured, hey, I'm near Big Lots. I, I'm pretty sure they've got glue at a really good price. So I go into Big Lots, and sure enough, I found just the glue I wanted. It was at a really good price, and I was really happy with that. So then I looked over, and I said, gee whiz, that's a really good price on a pair of jumper cables. So I picked them up. And I went a little further, and I said, man, I'll probably need to be doing some painting before long, and that's a really good, you know, paintbrushes are outrageous. So I, but that, that's a good price. So I picked up the paintbrush. I was redeeming those items, taking advantage of an opportunity afforded to me by the price put on them by the store. You ladies like to shop as recreation. I understand that. You also are very good at finding bargains too, so I know you understand what I'm talking about. I don't really like to shop, but... If I happen on a bargain, I'm just like you ladies. I like to take advantage of that bargain. So, this is how God wants us to live our life daily as we walk through life as believers. We happen upon something that catches our eye, takes our attention, causes us to pause, jump in there and redeem that moment. Make a purchase, if you will. Exchange your time. Stop what you're doing. Make a sacrifice. Get there a little late if you have to. Take advantage of that moment and use it to communicate truth to someone who may be outside of the faith. Redeeming the time. You know... We talked as we began here about walking in wisdom. And over the years, I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm not very much to talk to people, but I just try to live a good life and be a good example and hope everybody, you know, kind of sees that. Well, now, uh, that's good. We all should set a good example, and we all should present a good testimony. If we do not, then nobody's going to listen to us if we ever do speak. But here's the thing I want you to understand. Just living a morally good life in front of people is not enough. <clears throat> people will simply look at you and think you're a religious fanatic. That's all you're going to get out of that for the moment. But if you practice your religion, so to speak, practice your Christianity by doing good things for them, it'll look entirely different to them. They don't care, they don't care so much whether, you know, we don't do this, we don't do that, and we, you know, we believe this and we believe that. But when we redeem a moment to share a truth, with them, that probably is going to come, if, they, if God gives us that opportunity, it's going to probably come at a moment when they need something, just like the lady in that opening illustration. She was worried about what had happened to her friend. And beneath the surface, she was also worried about herself, perhaps. She didn't know whether she would make it either. But well, she found out because someone invested their wise walk in her day at that moment. And on other occasions, it might just be being kind to someone. 
It might be a word of encouragement. It, it might be something that, that doesn't get so far as an explanation of the gospel every time, but it's building bridges. Whatever that wisdom is, it's building bridges for that moment of opportunity when you can go to that extreme of sitting down with them and sharing the gospel with them. Okay, so walk in wisdom toward those on the outside, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time, by the way, that's taking advantage of the opportunities you've been praying for. This fits together. Pray for opportunities. When the opportunities come, you've got to take advantage of the opportunity. You've got to be opportunistic. And as I said last week, the more we pray for opportunities, the more our mind is going to be thinking about them, and we're going to recognize them when they happen and when they unfold in front of us. In fact, you're going to be dumbing around through life, you know, and all of a sudden, bam, somebody says something, and you think, it's almost like, wow, what happened? You know, and you've got, instead of being totally blown away by it and, and, and shocked by it and, uh, and maybe walk away wondering, you've got to understand as you're praying about it, look at that opportunity and bam, someone says something, someone has an issue, a problem, whatever that you can contribute to. That's a moment to take advantage. That's a moment to be a real Christian before someone who's not. So, our walk is important. Then secondly, I want you to know that in addition to our daily walk, our conduct, we also need to be careful about our words. Our words should always be captivating. Now I say captivating because I didn't really know how else to describe. It doesn't mean that you're eloquent or, you know, you, you always have the right word to say. But I'm simply saying your words should be a part of your walk. Our walk and our words are important. Our conduct and our conversation. What we do and what we say. Both are essential. Both are, are crucial to walking in wisdom. Reaching those on the outside. Now look at what he says about it in verse 6. Because he turns to the topic of our words or our speech in verse 6, he says, let your speech always be with grace. Let your speech always be with grace. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, we understand what the word grace means. We all know by grace are we saved through faith. It's God's grace that enables us through faith to be saved. He offers us a free gift. He offers us an opportunity we don't deserve it. Not a single solitary one of us deserve to go to heaven. But we're going to go there because of His grace if we placed our faith in Jesus. So we, we describe grace, we define grace as God's unmerited favor upon us. We don't merit it, but He grants His favor. He opens His arms in love. He receives us, saves our soul, gives us an eternal life, and uh, one that is absolutely secure. That's His grace. Now, <clears throat> the opposite of grace is judgment. That's what we do deserve. You see... We really are all over here under the judgment of God until we are recipients of His grace and we become His child. If it were not for grace, we would remain condemned. Now here's what I want you to think about in terms of your speech. The opposite of gracious speech is condemning speech. The opposite of graciousness in our words is criticism and harshness in what we say to others. Our speech is important. By the way, you know, we, we talked about praying for opportunities here. Let's just stop for a moment. 
Because what we're talking about in this week's message is doing our part when the opportunities come. You see, we don't, we don't just, we don't pray to God and ask God to do something and then we just walk away and say, well, done my part. No. Prayer is always coupled together with our responsible obedience. A farmer doesn't plant a crop, pray, God, give me a great harvest, then go in the house, prop his feet up and don't do anything. It doesn't go in the field for six months. Doesn't worry about the, you know, the, whether there's enough water on the crop, whether the, the weeds are taken over. He just, he's, I, well, I planted a crop and I prayed God, God will take care of it. No. He's got to put in his effort until the harvest comes. God answers prayer, but God answers prayer in and through and with our responsible obedience. So, we have to walk in wisdom toward those on the outside and we have to monitor our speech. We've got to be careful with our words. The first thing we have to do is learn to be gracious in how we speak to others. To be kind. To not be critical or harsh. Years ago, when I was in seminary, uh, we lived in a suburb of Chattanooga and I had to, early in the morning if I had an 8 o'clock class, which I often did, it was to face that morning traffic in the town. It would be about like living around here. Uh, and try, driving to Raleigh. You know, you got traffic in the morning. Well, we had a, a local Christian radio station, and there was a particular preacher, uh, an evangelist, that had a radio program about the same time every morning, I guess, about the time I was driving, so I was always listening. And uh, he was very well known back in those days. Uh, he memorized tons of scripture. Uh, I like to listen to him, but I have always remembered this one instance that he described in one of his radio programs. He and his wife were in a restaurant, and somebody got upset or was over there talking, and they were just using profanity right and left. And he said, so I stood up, and he said, I stood up, and I said to the guy, so everybody could hear, he said, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. God will not hold the guiltless who taketh his name in vain. Now, was that true? Yes. That's right out of the Ten Commandments, by the way, Exodus 20, verse 7. True statement. But it wasn't gracious, was it? You know, maybe in a different setting, one-on-one -on -one somewhere, in the right Attitude, he might have communicated that. But even then, I wonder. But certainly, doing so publicly in such a condemning manner is not being gracious. You say, but the man was a sinner. Yeah, I understand that. He didn't know any better. Sinners just act like sinners, you know? Every now and then, I go on vacation once in a while. I always try to play around the golf on vacation. Or every now and then... Uh, me and Peter will get paired up with two people we don't know. And that's always the funniest thing to me. But we'll play two or three holes, and, and, what, and sometimes those guys will be, you know, talking in a certain manner. And then finally one of them will say, man, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a Baptist preacher. And he goes, everything changes. <laughs> their, whole, their whole vocabulary just flipped, you know. I mean, You don't have to be condemning. You don't have to be obnoxious toward them. Your very presence, a different example. It may not be for very long, but it cleans up their speech real quick for a little while at least. We need to learn that God loves sinners. Yeah, they stand condemned. Yeah, they need to know that. They need to place their faith in Christ because of that. But if we, by being obnoxious in the way we approach them, push them away, we're not doing them any favor and we're not bringing any glory to God. Now, let's continue on. He says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. Now, 
<clears throat> gracious speech we have covered. But now we want to talk about using tactful words. Being able to say what needs to be said when it needs to be said in the right way that it needs to be said. Let's go back to that opening illustration. Oh, I hope he's in heaven. He was such a good man. He went to church. I, I hope he's in heaven. That was an opportunity to talk about this matter of we can know. We don't have to hope. It's an open door at a moment when someone was distressed. By the way, oftentimes your opportunity comes when people have problems, when they're distressed. And uh, it's, it's, it's in our flesh sometimes to condemn people and criticize them for creating their own problems and choices for the, by the choices they make sometimes, but that's not gracious and that's not tactful. What does he mean when he says seasoned with salt. Well, he uses the perfect tense here when he says seasoned with salt. He, it's, it, it means having been already seasoned with salt before the dish was put on the table. He's not talking about someone gets a plate of food and they put their salt on it before they eat. Our speech has to already, before it's put on the table, before it's put out there in public, it already has to be seasoned with salt. Now that phrase is, is easily understood. It means using salt to make food taste better. You know, there's some things, if, if, I, if I don't have salt to put on, I don't want to eat it. You know, are you like that with some things? I love fresh, right off the vine, sliced tomatoes on my plate. But it's got to have salt and pepper on it. I don't care for a tomato without salt and pepper. I just don't. I just, I've always put salt and pepper on it. But I love them. But I gotta have salt and pepper. A fried egg. I, I can, I, I can't eat an egg without salt and pepper. It's just, it's just not an egg to me. You, you've got the, some grits. I mean, how many of y'all, I gotta have some butter and some salt and pepper or the grits are no good. I don't want it. The salt here, in this verse means that we have got to add something, add something to our speech to make it palatable, acceptable to the other person. If we're harsh, critical, condemning, if we tell them they're going to hell, that's not going to get it done. Now eventually they've got to understand that uh, they're a sinner lost and in, uh, under condemnation, but you, you can't approach them by, you know, calling them sinners and yelling and screaming at them. Now, if, if you're preaching, maybe you can get away with that. Because you're not, you're, you're not embarrassing a single person necessarily or causing them to react to you. But if if you're one-on-one -on -one with someone in a restaurant like the evangelist I described, uh, you need to be careful to have your words seasoned with salt. Say, now listen, listen, I want to tell you something. This is not about knowing what to say. I have people say to me all the time, I just don't know, you know, I, Pastor, would you come and talk to someone about their salvation? I've, I've I, I would do it, but I just don't know if I have the right words to say. Well, neither do I. You see, because my words or your words are not going to get anybody into heaven. It's only the truth we speak that the Holy Spirit uses that's going to be the right combination of, that's going to deal with our heart. He can take the absolute worst gospel presentation that you could possibly make and use it. We can stumble around and, and, and bumble around, and, and, and we've all done it, and I walk away from a situation and say, boy, I really messed that up. But God will, and He can, and will use those opportunities. <clears throat> the key is to taking advantage of the opportunity the best way you can at the moment. 
You don't have to have the answer to everything. You don't have to do it in a perfect way. But you've got to come about it with the right attitude. That's what he's talking about here when he's talking about graciousness and seasoning. He's not saying you've got to have the exact words. He's not saying you've got to have the, the, the plan of salvation memorized. Good idea if you would. But, you know, you, you, he's not saying you've got to be able to answer every question they might ask you. He's saying you've got to approach them in the right way. Have the right attitude when you take advantage of the opportunity. That's what really matters. Now, our words then should be captivating. Gracious, seasoned with salt, but he goes on. He says, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Now, I just, I just shared with you that we're never going to, we're never going to perfectly communicate God's truth. We're, we're just not going to do it. I mean, I, I can tell you, every Sunday morning when I finish preaching, I go home and I think, boy, I should not have said this, I should have said that, I could have done this better over here, I didn't make that clear. You can't, you can't, you can't hardly tell someone your name and address and get it right. You know, I mean, you, you, it's not perfection that God requires. It's obedience. The knowing how we ought to answer every man is not here so much about the exact words, a memorized speech, or a vast knowledge of the Word of God. But the how to answer is all about the use of gracious speech, seasoned with salt, given forth at the right opportunity. It's about everything he's already said here. But it does indicate that we have to make a verbal response that has some content. An explanatory response. And if you look at it, I don't know if it's clear in the English, he says, season with salt that you may know. That's, again, in the perfect, or excuse me. Yeah, that's the perfect tense. And then where he says how to answer, that's, not in the tense of it, it's already been done, and it, it, it's done and it stays done, and the results are already there every moment. That's the perfect tense. But it's the aorist tense in the Greek, which means at the very moment of the opportunity, you speak what you need to speak. It, it tells us that we got to be prepared in advance. If you're not prepared, if you haven't thought about it, if you haven't prayed about it, if you haven't asked God for opportunities, if you haven't soaked in the Word of God, then you, it's going to be difficult to redeem the time when the moment comes. Not perfection, but action. Prepared in your mind and heart to take action. Now, there's a couple of places we'll go to here real quick. John 4, and I think we'll just stick with this one. John 4, 7, and then verses 9 and 10. Jesus is traveling through Samaria. He went through Samaria on purpose. Jews never went through Samaria. Uh, his disciples went into town to get food. He's sitting by a well. It's noontime. A woman comes to draw water. Women never came to the well at noontime to draw water. They always came in the morning. This woman was alone because she wasn't accepted by the good women folk of her city. She was an outcast, an immoral person. She's drawing her water, and Jesus says to her in verse 7, Give me a drink. Now that startled her, because number one, Jewish men never even spoke to Jewish women in public. That was their custom. That was their rule. And a Jewish person never spoke to a Samaritan, period. And he just went beyond both of those social norms to touch her life by saying, give me a drink. He wasn't being rude. He wasn't being demanding. He was being accepting of her. And so she says this, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me a drink? Being a Samaritan woman. For, Jesus, for Jews, she said, have no dealings with Samaritans. 
Then Jesus gave a response. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, God's grace, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And that led to her salvation. I won't go through the rest of it. It took a little while, but she come to believe that he was the Messiah. Changed her life. He did deal with her sin a little later. She had been married seven times. The man she was living with wasn't her husband. He didn't overlook her sin, but he was accepting of her person. He used grace and, and words that had been made palatable and tactful and seasoned. And he reached out to her. And when she responded, what? She had a question. Then he said, here's the answer. Now, when we learn to pray for opportunities, practice gracious speech, seasoned with salt, being opportunistic, redeeming the time, when those opportunities come, we, we then are obedient. We give that response. It may be a full blown gospel presentation, it may be a few words of testimony. Whatever it is, it's appropriate for the moment. God will use it. You see, evangelism is one of the most discouraging and difficult things that we have to do as Christians. Believe me, I, I, can, <clears throat> I can tell you gobs of stories of the people that have rejected and walked away and slammed doors in your face and called you names or whatever. That's the one aspect. Then there's those who say, oh yeah, yeah, I'll pray and accept Jesus, but... They never come to church, and they never get baptized, and, and their life never changes. It was just an empty profession, not a real decision. And you get all excited when someone bows their head and prays a prayer, but when you see there's no follow-through, you know that it was not anything that touched their heart. They were just, in their mind, going through the, the motions of doing something religious, hoping that maybe that would get them a little closer, but they weren't really willing to give their heart and life to Jesus. And when these things happen over and over, and by the way, the majority of responses are just as I described to you. More people reject Jesus Christ. Far more people reject Him than come to Him. If we allow that to become a discouragement to us, we will not be obedient. We have to understand our job is to glorify God our Father by how we act toward them and what we say to them. Our job is not to count how many really come to know Him. And when we get that understood, and we, we get that in our head and in our hearts, then it becomes a joy to answer every man when they ask us for the hope that's within us.